A couple of days ago I posted a video showing how to multiplex the 6522's output ports to allow many devices to share the same pins. It allowed me to go from using up all of the pins on the 6522 just to drive the LCD and some buttons, to having those devices share most of their pins, leaving enough free pins to connect four more devices using the same sharing mechanism. In this video, I'd like to show you how we can use an addressable latch to go beyond that and provide access to even more data outputs, allowing many more devices to be controlled. If you followed along with what I said earlier, you would now have six free pins here that you could use to drive devices, one of which drives the LCD, one of which is now driving the buttons, so there are then four more pins that you could use for four more devices. And remember two of the pins were used by the LCD there. That's not the most efficient use of six pins though. In theory, six pins have two to the power of six, which is what, 64 states? But we're only using six of them. So how can we do a better job of packing this stuff in so we can get even more devices connected to even fewer pins? This would be important if one of your devices needed more than two of these auxiliary control lines that the LCD has here. Supposing one of your devices needed four additional control lines on top of the eight data lines, then you'd only have four pins free here and that's, that's not so many devices you could connect that way. So what I've added to the circuit here is what's called an 8-bit addressable latch. It's a 74HCT259 and eight of, its out, eight of its pins are outputs which are individually controllable. And that's the distinction between this and um, something like a 374, which is, uh, it's, it's also an 8-bit latch, but with the 374, when you want to change its value, you have to actually change all 8 pins at once. Similar to the way the port A and port B on the 6522 work, you can't just change one of the pins, you have to write all the pins at once. So, you know, you need some extra code in the CPU to read the old pins and merge in your new value, for example, if you're doing that. That's not the case with this chip. This chip allows you to individually pick one of its pins and set what its value should be. So we have the power and ground hooked up already there. Um, what I'm going to do is hook up some LEDs to the output pins. Just using these bar graph LEDs as they're called. Um, let's get a resistor array in. This is 4K, no, 470 ohm resistors here. Um, that wants to be connected to ground. Have to use a blue wire run out of black. And I'm going to connect the data pins of the 259 to eight of these LED segments. And the data pins start, I think that's the high pin, pin seven if you like. Connect that one to the top LED. Pin six to the next LED. Pin five. pin 4, and the remaining 4 pins are on the bottom, so I'm going to, let's start with the lowest pin, that will be pin 0, and that comes across to, I think it's pin 4 on the 259 is bit 0, then the next one up. Notice these are crisscrossing now because they, they kind of come down the other side of the chip in the opposite order to the, to the far side. And finally, the last one. So that's all in place, so the LED will now show the status of the data on the 74HCT259. So the three pins in this corner down here are what's called address pins, and they form the binary address of which, pin, which bit you want to actually affect the value of. If these are all low, then, the, then bit 0 has its value changed. 
and if they're all higher than bit 7 and, and so on in between. I'm going to connect these through to the bottom three bits oops, the bottom three bits of port A on the 6522. I'm just going to use this uh, rainbow ribbon cable thing for now to do that. So, so now the bottom three bits of port A will control which bit on the 259 is going to get changed. And the next pin along the top row that we didn't connect before is a data pin. This pin gives the value that we want to assign to the bit. So with the bottom three bits here, we're going to choose which bit gets changed. And with the next bit up on port A, that's bit th this, this pin is bit three of port A, I've hooked that through to the data pin of the 259. So when we set port A's bottom three bits to zero and then the next bit up to a one, it will set the lowest bit in the 259. If we set the bottom three bits of port A to ones uh, and the next bit up to a zero, it will clear bit seven on the 259. Finally, we need to connect the two remaining pins on the 259. The two remaining pins are a master reset pin, which I'm going to pin high because I don't want to ever reset. Like that. And the remaining pin is like an enable pin. Um, the 259 will remember the value that's been stored in it indefinitely. Um, but when the, when the enable pin is brought low, I think it's called latch enable when it's brought low, that's when the new value is read from, from the input data bit and it gets written into the appropriate bit. So I don't want this to happen all the time. The reason for that is when we, when we apply a new value on the 6522, some of these pins might get their value, it might go high or low before other ones do. It's not guaranteed that they'll all flip at exactly the same time. And the 259 might see that and sort of smear the right across all of the bits of the, of the 259. And I don't want that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to connect the latch enable pin, pin on the 259 to the CPU's Phi 1 pin. And the Phi 1 pin is the opposite signal to the regular CPU clock. And what this means is that when the CPU clock is high, Phi 1 will be, zero, will be low and at that point we will allow the 259 to update its state. When phi1 is high and phi2 is low, we will not allow the state to be updated. And the critical thing here is that that period with phi2 being low is the point at which the bits inside the 6522 change. You can check the data sheet to make sure that's the case. Um, I'm going to connect that to pin 3 on the 652. 02, 6502 is up there, that's the CPU, and connect, connect that through to the latch enable pin on the 259. So now that all of those addressable bits are, are visible to the 6502, and I've updated the code that you saw before, so that now every time I press a button, it's going to add one to a value, and then push that value out onto port A. So this value starts at zero and it sort of gradually works its way up. When, 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 when port A is written as zero, of course, the bottom three bits are zero and the data bit is also zero. So that means we're going to write a zero into bit zero on the 259. The next value up um, would be the address being one, but the data bit still being zero. So that means we're going to clear the bit one on the 259. After that, we'll clear bit two, then bit three, bit, then bit four, all the way up to bit, seven, to bit seven. When the number that I'm incrementing gets to eight, it's gonna, the, the, the bottom three pins address is going to wrap back round to zero, and now the data pin is going to be set high. So at that point, we're actually going to set bit zero on the 259. After that, we're going to write nine, which will set bit one, 10 will set bit two, 11 will set bit three, and so on. So what we should get is a sort of a light effect of sort of gradually setting all the LEDs, then gradually clearing all the LEDs over there. So let's turn it on and see what happens. So you can see one of them's come on to start with. The program's still running fine, which is good good to see. One of them's come on to start with. That's I don't think that's the initial state of the 259. I suspect what happened there was that it took a short while for the 6522 to fully initialize and set port A to be outputs. And during that period, 
I suspect what happened was that the 259 saw all of its inputs being high and it's written a 1 into bit 7. That's not a problem, it's just something we need to bear in mind um, because it means we don't have full control over the initial state of this chip. Now, one option to get around that may be to use a capacitor to slow down the, uh, the, the, the regular CPU reset signal um, and connect that up to the reset pin on the 259. There's an option there, but it um, depends if it's necessary for what you're doing. So what I can do now is push the buttons, and every time I push the button, it will actually clear the bits. They're already clear, so for a while it's not going to do anything. Now you can see it's cleared bit 7, and when I release it, it's going to set bit 0. But obviously you can't see that, and the reason for that is that every time we send something to the LCD, and every time we pull the buttons, we're actually setting all of these bits to 0. We could make the code smarter and make it not change the values of these bits when we're pulling the LCD or when we're writing the LCD or pulling the buttons. Um, in an ideal world I think that's what we would do. Uh, but I haven't done that, so bit zero will always get cleared as soon as we set it, so that's expected. If I push the button one more time then we should see bit one get set. And if I release the button, bit two gets set. Push another button, bit three gets set. And now I can push another button, because it doesn't really matter if I'm pushing or releasing, as long as the loop can, carries on, it'll set another bit. Uh, and as I, as I keep pushing buttons, it will set the remaining bits. And then it will start clearing them. So that's quite cool. We have eight individually addressable LEDs there. LEDs are not very useful, but what we could do is now use those as the enable inputs on other devices. In fact, we could rewire our LCD to be driven by one of those instead of using up a whole pin on the, on, on the 6522. Similarly, the buttons, we can wire them up to those instead of the, the 6522. So this, is, this can act as a sort of breakout, which breaks out three pins here, plus one for the data line it needed, into eight pins, which is not bad value for money. Anyway, that, I think that's it for today. Hope you enjoyed it. Uh, please like and subscribe as usual. Comment down below if you've got any questions about this. Um, if you're interested in seeing more things you can do with the 6522, I've certainly explored it quite a long way beyond these points. If you want to see how the timers work or how to use interrupts, if you want your buttons to generate interrupts when you press them or anything like that, uh, let me know. I'd be very happy to do a video on, on, on those topics and, and show you how those things work.